think these are often experiences that I don't think language captures particularly well. Mm. Um, uh, it, you know, it really quite requires an unusual sort of imaginative engagement, really, with what somebody isn't saying to you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's almost like that silence of the unspoken experience. There's you know, almost like a sort of an invisible wall between people who have been traumatised uh, and the community. And, and there's an extraordinary, at times, lack of empathy mm. uh, for people who've had terrible things happen to them. When, when people have horrible things happen to them, I mean, the issue is about really how you sort of remove, you know, the emotion from um, sort of intruding and dominating your life. You know, I think the essence of post-traumatic stress disorder is, is it's really about memory and the way that, um, you, you know, we, t we tend to think of memory as being uh, a visualisation or a sort of a, a, a verbal narrative of a circumstance. But in, in making up a, a memory, I mean, experience actually involves sound, it involves taste, it involves smell, yeah. it involves proprioception. Um, it involves um, emotion, quite apart from the visual and, 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 and sort of the verbal narrative that you might create. And you can imagine that if you have extraordinarily intense experiences that often they get stuck in those primary senses and don't really get converted in, into, a, into a sort of a, a verbal representation. Stress exposure, um, you know, puts people into this state where, in a sense, they're trying, you know, and there are very sort of clear neuro neurological pathways that are involved, and basically, you, you know, you wear your brain out.
These are memories that have a, have a, a vividness and a reality that is really unseriated and, and, and sort of undigested, if you will. So there's a particular rawness of, of the memory. And, um, and equally, you know, people then engage in a whole sort of life of trying to avoid what brings those memories back. Emotion becomes something you generally might try and avoid. You know, people become quite emotionally numbed and shut off. You know, I mean, one of the interesting parts about this is that one of the least studied emotions is horror. I mean, if you look up in a textbook an emotion, virtually nobody studied horror. Even, you know, what, what is horror? I mean, is, you know, what, what are the elements of horror? Um, and, um, you know, so I think there's a whole, you know, there's a whole world of, of what these sorts of experiences evoke in people that we just never speak of. I mean, I think that's why, you know, art and literature are such essential sort of elements of this discussion. You know, you disengage, in, you know, from social company, but equally you're very vulnerable to challenge and threat. So you become more reactive and irritable. You know, you startle, you don't sleep. You have this sort of mental world where, you know, it's it's readily intruded upon by these experiences. you know, graphic sort of visual imagery in the media, yeah. I think people assume that they um, know and understand what they're seeing, mm. but they just don't. No. Um, and um, you, you, you know, I think it just creates a tremendous sort of isolation and anomie in a way, for people who've had these sort of experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly when, you know, I think they try and re-establish intimate relationships with people and, you know, begin to sort of try and give an inkling of what might have happened, yeah. only to be sort of not understood or what they're saying being misconstrued. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I, th I think everybody's the poorer for it. 
you know, I think it means that societies don't anticipate what they get themselves into when it involves, you know, going to war. Yeah. And equally about trying to allow people to re-enter civilization when they've been in hell. The other side of that is that then fatigue, you know, becomes part of that memory. Um, and it's interesting how many of the post-deployment syndromes involve soldiers' preoccupation with the feelings of fatigue. So fatigue is no longer, you know, something's like a, it's like a, a welcomed entry into sleep. You know, it becomes a reminder of just the ex intense exhaustion of trying to survive. Right. And you know, and I think you know that the, the more exhausted you become, the narrower your window window of survival becomes, and you you know you can you know become careless, but you know also numb numb to risk, and that's you know a very dangerous state of mind to be. It's a bit like soldiers in Vietnam. You know, one of the things that DVA often wants a soldier to do is say, well, what was the point where, you know, what was the most traumatic moment for you? And, you know, that's really got to be the sentinel moment that leads to you becoming unwell. But look, you know, you can wander around the jungle for a year and never be shot at and come across dead bodies or um, know if colleagues have been shot. Um, and just that constant state of arousal uh, and that risk, you know, I think can... Um, you know, leave you in a state where, um, well, you know, your, your mind gets captured by it. Really.
I mean, they knew their reality, and they, you know, and those who survived. I mean, I, you know, I can give you many stories of, you know, often they developed many skills and, you know, a sense of morality because of what they'd been through that actually, I think, did make, make them different and, and, you know, gave them a sense of self-determination. Um, and, you know, they, they, they knew what they could and couldn't trust in themselves. And, you know, I think that does put them into a different world. And so they could look at these other people around them and say, well, look, you know, you've just been sitting around on the couch watching TV and drinking beer all day. You know, and the, the, you know, I think there's a there's a sort of a, a, a toughness, which is not just about being ruthless. It's about knowing what you can and can't do, and knowing how to survive. You know, you ha you, you you know, I think that there is a, a a subtlety of of motivation and capacity for people who who you know tested themselves. Converting the, um, the the memory into a visual, from a, in, into a sort of verbal representation, does help defray the intensity of the emotion. I mean, it actually it really removes, I think, a degree of the rawness of that sensory sort of memory, which is also sort of imbued with with fear and horror. You know, it was a war which, you know, I think don't, don't think was morally or politically justified. Um, and, you know, I think that just sort of added to the difficulties that these men faced. And then there was, uh, you know, the, the complete sort of demonisation of them, which even sort of further shut down that capacity yeah. to speak. If you're overreactive to your environment, you begin to cut aspects of your life out. You know, you remove yourself from intimacy because intimacy makes you feel more vulnerable. You know, there are all sorts of adaptations like that. Yeah. And, and, and though, so, you know, it's, it's partly, a, you know, an issue about neurobiology, but it's also partly about the way you structure your life to live within your, your, your symptoms and your, your state of mind. Whereas, you know, with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's like the memory sits between you and 
and your environment. And in, in a way, you often in, experience the memory more than what you do, the world in front of you. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's what post-traumatic stress disorder is about. I think one of the other things is really the loss of ability to enjoy pleasure. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the emotional numbing, I think, is a huge issue for, for, for veterans. Um, you know, because they, they become... Their adaptation is one of, well, if you're going to suppress fear, you also suppress your capacity to, you know, in, in have pleasure. and. I mean, in fact, you, you, some people you know, get involved in self-mutilation because it's worse to feel nothing than pain. Mm. Pain is better. Pain at least makes you feel alive. Mm. And that's why some of them get involved in, in risk-taking behaviour. When, when people have horrible things happen to them, I mean, the issue is about really how you sort of remove, you know, the emotion from um, sort of intruding and dominating your life. And, and you can imagine that involves, you know, inhibitory systems uh, in the brain. Now, the point is if you can drive your car along at 60 kilometres an hour with one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator, or you can drive along 60 kilometres an hour with one foot on the accelerator, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's quite obvious that you know, if you've got one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator when you get to a hill, um, it's a much less stable system and you're going to wear the vehicle out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the effects is that you know, stress exposure um, you know, puts people into this state where in a sense they're trying, you know, and they're, they're very sort of clear neuro neurological pathways that are involved and basically you, you, know, you wear your brain out. And, um, and you know, I think that's really the great challenge of history actually. Is you know how you uh, you know integrate that private voice and the horror of what people endure with the often um, grossly sort of simplified and misrepresented statements of, of of generals, which is what writes history. <laughs>